स्टडी आई क्यू आई एस अब तैयारी हुई अफोर्डेबल हेलो एंड नमस्ते द वर्ल्ड इज लुकिंग टू वर्ड्स the south china sea that is the indo pacific as the next theater of war between us and china they are even predicting that the third world war is going to take place in south china sea due to the territorial uh, claims by china on that region but they are ignoring one other new theater of war that is the arctic and some even say that there are five different races that are taking place between various countries such as us china canada the nordic countries and even russia now these countries are engaged in various races towards exploitation of resources towards opening up of new transport routes and even having their military presence to safeguard their interests which are in other words that there is a new conflict coming up in geopolitics today's discussion will be around this new conflict it's going to talk about, we are going to talk about uh, the various races that is happening we are going to take a look at the different uh, official policies of us canada uh, nordic countries russia china and even india and we are going to finally conclude by looking at the policies and the reality that is happening in the arctic especially the impact of the races on the human life now before we go on to this discussion i want to bring to your notice a new batch that is prelims to interview batch starting from 11th of september the course is for 70000 rupees uh, but if you use the code dwlive you're going to get it at 29999 rupees the course is in english english and hindi now if you're thinking about the upsc journey or even are in a dilemma just go to the study iq website take a look at the features you will yourself realize that apart from the best content taught by the best teachers in your journey there is help given through this course at every point from your preparation of prelims where there is mentorship there is crux there is handwritten notes and once you clear your prelims there is something called the mrp that's the mains residential program in which study iq will uh, you know bring the bring you to their office and give you extensive training and you know how to write answers and conceptual clarity and everything which will help you in cracking mains and post mains there is of course the interview guidance program as well all of this included in this course so go ahead take a look at the study iq website take a look at the features you yourself will realize what a benefit it will be with this course to your journey so let's move ahead with the discussion now this is the territorial claim of arctic now where is arctic it's of course the north pole now arctic and antarctic these two that is the north and the south pole are essential for global temperature now they are also known as world's refrigerator because of the ice in these two areas they help in reflecting sun rays which helps in balancing the global temperature in a you know a, in a habitable temperature range now with the ice melting there is bound to be intensive heat waves which is going to be harmful for not only humans but all sorts of life in this world and this is what the fear is this is what several activists are calling out that there is a rapid decrease in the ice cap in both the pole now interestingly this is not something uh, this is not a new it's not a, a new kind of information we have been having this information for a very long time but the countries have ignored it for the resource race they have largely seen that their national interest is about in is in about exploiting these resources and who will have the claim on these resources first all of this begins around 1920s when this world war treaty was signed on the territorial claim on this region now the swall war treaty by was signed by various countries including india china uh, and other such countries now once the second world war uh, uh, finishes and the cold war starts off during this period both us and ussr start building military bases in this region and uh, they not only have missiles uh, you know set up there they are also they also set up uh, small research centers small uh, you know uh, small units are positioned in these waters and some even on the polar ice cap now the reason why uh, the two uh, powers were 
uh, claiming this territory was that they knew that at one point of time that uh, there is going to be, um, you know, uh, due to global warming, there will be melting of the ice cap, which is going to lead to resource availability. But with the collapse of USSR, this race subsides. And in 1996, the Arctic Council is formed. But before we go on to the Arctic Council, I would want you to take a look at the territorial uh, claims. So if you look at it, around 33% is claimed by Russia itself. So Russia has a larger claim on this Arctic Circle uh, rather than any other country. Apart from that, there is Norway, Greenland via Denmark. So this is another substantial claim that the Nordic countries have. There is claim by Canada and a very limited claim by US. I would want to draw your attention that there is no claim by China on this area or in this area. It is largely Russia, US, Canada and the Nordic countries. Now, this territorial claim is according to the UNCLOS or that's what they claim. Because UNCLOS, that is the United Nations Convention of the Law of the Sea, says that a country from its shorelines has access to resources around 300 kilometers or 200 nautical miles, uh, which means that at the border of the polar ice cap, they are able, they can actually uh, lay claim to any resources that are available. But the oil and gas that is actually available is beyond that, uh, you know, the UNCLOS approved line, but they largely ignore it. They actually continue to draw the line till the end point that is at the, you know, the, uh, the exact point of the North Pole. But so if you look at the uh, claim lines, you will realize that Russia has had a stronger territorial claim in this area. Now, another question that comes up is, how is their territorial claims in the Arctic while there are no territorial claims in the Antarctic? Because Antarctic comes in something called the global commons. If we take a look, there is a concept of global commons which includes the high seas, it includes Antarctic, it includes atmosphere and the space. And in these areas, no country can actually claim jurisdiction. It is common to humanity, it's common to everyone. But Arctic was never included in this global common system. Why? Because all of these countries, especially the two superpowers during the Cold War, had already laid claim to this place. And they never wanted to dilute this claim. So that is the reason why it was never included in the global commons. Moving ahead, we move to Arctic Council. Now, this was formed in 1996. There are eight members. It is an intergovernmental forum to basically resolve any disputes, take care of the Arctic, as well as support the indigenous population in who are living in uh, inside the Arctic Circle. So there are particular purposes for which these countries basically come to cooperate. Now, interestingly, there is also 13 observer states. Who are these observer states? Uh, these are states who are interested to lay a claim. They are interested to be part of this discussion. It includes countries like China, Germany and India. Now, the member states are basically US, Russia, Canada, Finland, Sweden, Denmark, Norway and Iceland. So basically the peripheral states who are there uh, to the Arctic Circle. Now the Arctic Circle recently was in news as well. So in March 2022, the presidency of the council had gone to Russia and uh, none of the other members wanted Russia to be the president. So they decided not to go ahead with any summit. Uh, in the year 2022. They instead formed another grouping which kept Russia outside and continued with their meetings. In other words, there is already divisions in the grouping uh, which was previously there but the dispute settlement doesn't work in this council. Anyway, moving on. If we look at the resources. Now, quoting a couple of papers, a 2018 National Aeronautics and Space Administration report said that Arctic has lost around 21,000 square miles of sea, uh, sea ice per year in the last five decades. 
the temperature in the Arctic is increasing at the rate twice the global average. By 2030, the region is expected to become a forcing horse for energy expansion. So by 2030, the ice cap is going to be really minimum and energy exploration is going to happen. So the race is bound to heat up as we move towards the next decade to the middle of the, this decade. So in other words, Arctic is no longer the polar ice cap that we actually know or we actually read of. Things are heating up. Countries are exploring and exploiting already. Now, this is of course a very powerful strategic location because it connects the Eurasian region with the Euro. The shortest route is between or passes through the Arctic Circle actually. Uh, and because of which it is just not the resources but also connectivity that matters. And that is precisely why China is interested. Now let's move on to the races. Now the first race that we can talk about is the race for trading routes. Now if we talk about the existing trading route, it is via the Suez Canal. As per a report in the US government, around 20,000 ships pass annually through the Suez Canal. But if the northern sea route opens up or becomes functional, then it is going to be the shortest route between Eurasia or Euro, uh, Europe and Asia, which also means that this route can be skipped and th the northern sea route can be preferred, especially by not only Russia, but also China. Now, the distance from Europe in the existing route it is calculated if the northern sea route opens up, the distance will be shortened by almost 35 to 40 percent. And that is something China is very interested. And that is the reason why in China's policy, this sea route is seen as the polar sea route or the polar silk route. And it is part of China's official policy towards Arctic. Now, if we move towards the another sea route that's going to open up, it is the sea route that it's going to pass through the Canadian waters. It is known as the Northwest Passage. Now, Canada has already laid claim to this passage route. There is no other competition in this route. Uh, US has not really challenged Canadian authority over this route, despite Alaska being part uh, very close to this route. So, Canada has already said that this is where it's going to uh, focus on uh, in the near future for its trade because it's not only going to connect uh, the European or the Atlantic Sea via the Arctic Sea and going and opening up in the Bering Sea and then towards uh, Asia. So that is one more route that was going to open up as Arctic starts melting. Now there's of course a third route that everyone is talking about and that is the transpolar route. Now, transpolar would be a route that is going to cross across the Arctic Pole. It is going to take some time because a transpolar route would mean that the, the entire ice cap has melted. That's going to be disastrous for human life. So, even before that route takes off, human life will be in far more danger because of it. But yes, these two routes, especially the Northern Sea Route is what uh, is being focused on. Chinese company known as Costco, that's C-O-S-C-O, it has already said that by 2025, it is going to use the Northern Sea Route and is going to have a trade of around 200 ships. So currently in the summer month, part of the Northern Sea Route is opened up, has opened up and around 100 ships actually pass through it. Uh, but Costco has said that it's, it's going to increase the number of ships to 200 or 300 uh, in the coming years and it's going to dominate the trade that is going, going to happen through the Northern Sea Route, which is again a welcome news to Russia. Moving on to the next race, race for supremacy. Now, race for supremacy is a strategic race. As I've already mentioned during the Cold War, US and USSR had already put in their missiles and bases here. Now, once Cold War came to an end with the collapse of USSR, these bases were slowly uh, dismantled, some just were abandoned and just left to the nature. 
but once russia comes back and there is a you know there's a growth of russia and russia starts looking at the arctic as part of its policy russia starts reviving those bases in some cases it starts building new bases as well so if you look at the map you will see new bases have come up in the russian sphere of influence the recent one is the kotelny island right here apart from that even china has been uh, helping russia in building these bases uh, us on the other hand has very selective bases uh, in the nordic countries there is a collaboration with the nordic countries uh, canada has some of it uh, apart from that actually there are no uh, you know that the race is largely a russian uh, race at this point of time russia is far ahead than any other con peripheral country in the arctic moving on we come to the third race which is the race for resources now uh, us geological survey of 2008 estimated that arctic could hold 90 billion barrels of oil 669 trillion cubic feet of natural gas and 44 billion barrels of natural gas liquids now that's a lot of hydrocarbons we are talking about especially for a world which has already explored and exploited a large chunk of its hydrocarbons and now the countries that already have the hydrocarbons they're dominating the price now these countries especially russia who wants to get out of the sanctions china who wants to uh, dictate terms in the oil market the hydrocarbon market and us who wants to have or ha continue to have the control over the oil market they are all in this race for resources apart from this there are of course rare min uh, minerals there is uranium there is gold and there are many others uh, minerals that is reported to be present under the ice cap and all of these countries in the name of scientific research are actually looking and hunting for these resources this is one of the worst races that is happening because it is not openly happening it is being disguised as scientific research and collaboration and countries are basically looking for what kind of minerals are hidden where in the arctic circle this is the kind of race which cannot really be stopped you can you know their military races can be stopped uh, the you know the race for supremacy the race uh, sphere of influence all of this could be you know put a hold on but this kind of a disguised race is something that cannot be put off because this is seen as crucial for scientific research but once it is found out that what kind of minerals are there private players will be pushed in for exploitation of these resources moving on to the next race that is the race to attract tourism now this in this race it is the nordic countries which are at the foremost so what have the nordic countries done they have started this cruise industry so there's already a cruise uh, known as msc meraviglia and these cruises basically stop at small towns which are located inside the arctic circle the reason for that is to watch the northern lights or the aurora borealis and uh, more and more tourists are opting for these kind of cruise tourism now the problem with cruise tourism is that there's a huge number of people who are being brought in these big sea liners and the a uh, habitat in the arctic circle is not suitable for so much of movement or people and this is changing the climate this is changing the habitat animals like polar bears are moving further to the north uh, than previously their seal number of seals have actually come down fishes have reduced in these waters so there is an impact of tourism but nordic countries are you know racing towards bringing more and more tourism and if you look at it the mainland europe is already overpopulated with uh, tourists so now the elite tourists are moving towards the nordic countries opting for cruise liners to go and have a better look at the northern lights we move to the next race that is the race to save the arctic now there is this is a race that uh, largely the ngos the activists and un is fighting for as we already in the previous four races are spoiling arctic global warming apart from the excessive presence of uh, human population in, inside the circle right now has meant that global uh, the melting of ice has fa fastened that is it is happening at a much more rapid pace than it was previously happening and as the previous four races heat up 
it is going to get worse. So there is now a race amongst the people who want to save Arctic because if Arctic is not saved, if an, the polar ice cap is completely melted, there will be an increase in the sea level, the temperatures of the earth are going to go up and it's ultimately going to affect us as humans. And this is something countries are largely ignoring in these races. Now, let's take a look at the various policies. So if you look at the US policy, there is a narrative in the US media that says that the US is losing the race for the Arctic. Now, why is this narrative there? Because US policy per se is not very well directed towards these races. The last policy was under the Obama presidency in 2013, which was national strategy for the Arctic region, in which there were three highlights. So that is one is advancing US security interests. Second is pursuing responsible Arctic region stewardship, strengthening international cooperation. Now, the first one that is US security interest. Now, this covers everything, which also allows US military to be present there. But Alaska is the region that is closest to the Arctic. And Alaska is already very rich in gas and oil, which means that US is far more busy with Alaska and protecting the waters around Alaska rather than actually laying claim to the region of Arctic. It is largely moving towards South China Sea, looking towards South China Sea and other territorial claims of China rather to the Arctic. Despite the fact that US has around five icebreakers, US has not really stepped up on the game of claiming Arctic. It's there in the papers, but in reality, the presence of US is minimal amongst the other players in this region. We move on to the next. That is Russia's policy. Now, Russia has various policy statements on this. The recent one, of course, by, was by Putin presidency, in which it had clearly mentioned that Russia's policy towards Arctic was not just about resources, but also having a significant claim of ownership. Because of which, in August 29, an ocean shield exercise was held in the northern parts of Russia to indicate how much of a military presence and hold Russia has in this region. But officially, it says that it will utilize its natural resources, protect its ecosystems, use the sea as transportation system in Russia's interest, ensure that it remains a zone of peace and cooperation. That is the irony, right? Having military presence, increasing military presence, and then saying it's going to be a zone of peace and cooperation. Irony, which is uh, a geopolitical fact. But Russia is also the country which has the most number of icebreakers. So it has around 41 icebreakers in these waters, which also means that they are the ones who are going to be uh, present, not only militarily, but also opening up transportation or connectivity uh, tra transit routes. Russia is therefore going to be a very strong voice in the Arctic in the near future as well. Uh, one can even argue that they have already won the race uh, compared to US. Now, moving on to the next, that is China's Arctic policy. Now, this policy was given in 2018. Now, China is not in the periphery of Arctic, but they want to piggyback on Russia and be present there. Why? Trade route. Anywhere there is trade, China wants to have a say in it. It's as clear as day, right? It's China is always going to be there wherever there is economic profit. As simple as that. So in its policy, it talks about interest of near Arctic countries. It says that Arctic Circle is not just about Arctic countries, not only peripheral countries. Even near Arctic countries should have their say. Because China is not near Arctic. It's not in Arctic Circle. It is near Arctic country. Because of which its policy clear states that as near Arctic country, it has an interest in this region. It has also talked about a polar silk route for which it has two icebreakers. The recent one that has been put into action is the Zeolong 2 or the Snow Dragon 2. Now, this is in addition to what Russian snowbreakers are already working on. It's just an addition to Russia. And as I said, China is piggybacking on Russia in this area. 
The third is of course Arctic Research Collaboration, Developing Tourism, Contributing to Arctic Governance through the Arctic Council. So even though Russia has been chucked out of the new Arctic Council, China is right there as an observer state to actually protect Russia and China's interest in this region. Uh, interestingly, China has also gone ahead and said that it's going to help Russia in building uh, or setting up bases in this region uh, as well as invest in operating naval ports in these waters so that the transit route can actually take off as early as possible. Now again, China is famous for making ports, but always these ports are under debt trap. Now, Russia has already been is, is already inside the debt trap, but Russia is more and more going towards it. Interesting point to be noted here as well is that previously Russia was always the senior partner in the relation between Russia and China. But now with the debt trap going on and China increasingly giving more and more loan to Russia to build naval bases, to build ports, all of this indicates that China is shifting the balance slowly towards itself and China is becoming the senior partner in this relation, which means that in the future, this Russia's claim will come with a slight hyphen. It's going to be Russia, China's claim on this region rather than just Russian claim. Let's move on to the next policy that is of the Nordic countries. Now, these countries they are really not that uh, not such powerful countries their policy is largely security stability interest based international cooperation and sustainable development they have largely uh, joined hands with us and canada to protect their interests uh, but increasingly in the last few years that is from 2020 18 2022 uh, we have seen couple of Nordic summits in which these Nordic countries have come together and have formulated policies such as these. Moving on to the next country that is India's Arctic policy. Now India is not in the periphery, it doesn't claim to be a near Arctic country but it is having a policy on the Arctic because it says that it is one of the multipolar one of the poles in this multipolar world and it has to protect the interest of other countries including the ones in the global south. So that is the reason why India has a Arctic policy. Now if we talk about India's Arctic engagement it starts with 1920. I have already mentioned this that India was uh, has signed this World War Treaty. Uh, in 2007 there was a scientific expedition 2008. The research base that is Himadri was established 2014. In Arc that is a multi-sensory observatory was established and in 2016 a new laboratory was also established in Svalbard. Now, India's Arctic, pillar, uh, Arctic policy has six pillars, science and research, national capacity building, governance and international cooperation, transportation and connectivity, economic and human development, climate and environmental practices. So these six pillars, basically, if you look at it, sums up uh, not only research, science and research on it, it sums up transportation, it also sums up human development that is of the indigenous people. Now, India has always seen skill building, capacity building as one of its core features of its policies, especially soft power policy. And it is there in this policy as well. Uh, now, the question is, all of these policies look good on paper. What is the reality? The reality is, of course, the race for resources. The five races that we have talked about, somewhere hidden in these words, somewhere hidden behind these pillars of each country is this aim of race. And slowly as the Arctic waters or the ice pole starts melting, uh, the trade route will open up and all of these countries are going to start racing towards exploring and exploiting. South China Sea, which is what we are all looking at, is going to be slowly forgotten, slowly pushed away while the race to Arctic is going to hit or become hot. Now, this is not only bad news for us as humans, but also for the world. Because if the, all the countries start engaging into these races, it is going to be, it's going to escalate or, uh, you know, uh, fasten the uh, rapid, rapid pace of global warming which ultimately will completely devastate the sensitive uh, ecosystem in that region. 
from plants to animals to even live, you know, small organisms, all will be wiped off. Along with it, the high, the sea level are going to go up, which is going to affect small island developing states, the SIDS country. Apart from that, countries are have to, you know, the heat waves and everything is going to affect the countries that lie at the equatorial region. So there's going to be multiple things which are going to start happening as the Arctic is start going to melt. But countries, as I've repeatedly said, is largely ignoring it. They're all racing towards resources, all racing towards more and more, uh, you know, uh, laying their claim on this region, which ultimately is going to be a loss for entire humanity. No country is actually going to win this race. No country. And that is the sad reality of these races. With this, we come to an end to today's discussion. Thank you. Study IQ IS. Ab tayari hui affordable.